There were a group of children in South Australia that had significant disabilities, so significant physical and intellectual disability, that the system really let down. David was about four and uh, we went to the spastic centre because she had no, no else to go. There was no kindy, no, she wasn't able to go to school. And they said, sorry, she doesn't fit the criteria. She's too disabled to be, become part of the spastic centre. So we were sort of left in, a, in limbo. You know, what do we do now? We had two state-run institutions. Uh, one of them was Strathmont Centre. It was a place that housed uh, about 600 people in the northern suburbs. And we had Rurua Nursing Home, uh, which was originally in North Adelaide. And in 1978, it moved into what was called Escort House, uh, which had been used by the spastic centres of South Australia and people moved there. And it was a double storey place. It was a huge fire risk and people were crammed in. There was no personal space. You had a locker and then all of your clothes were kept in a communal wardrobe. And uh, you know, whether you wore your clothes or someone else's clothes it was just a matter of luck. They had places in the rural nursing home for people like Debbie who were severely uh, disabled. They said, you take this place or you go to the bottom of the list again and sort of it puts you in a, big, a bit of a dilemma. You know, what do I do? What do I do? Um, and at that age, I was 25. She was eight. And uh, in the end, we said, well, all right, we'll get her to Rua Rua, which she did. And that was um, very hard. My mother would obviously go and visit. And she'd say, oh, Debbie looks awful. <laughs> She's got this black T-shirt, her hair's too long, and <clears throat> things like that. And I said, Mum, don't tell me that, and all that sort of thing. You know, that really upset me. Largely, uh, institutions have their rules their structures, their procedures, and people fit in. Institutions never serve the individual. Basically, individuals fit into the institution. And there was a view that we needed to change this. Those changes that occurred uh, in South Australia uh, came from uh, the creation of the Intellectual Disability Services Council, IDSC. And in its constitution, there was a commitment to community living. There's Georgina, Greg, Debbie and Adrian. And it was community living. They went out shopping to get the groceries. She seemed more relaxed. There's more individuality there. People were always there doing things with them. All of the, the clients here, it was, it, was, it was great. It was really like a home. It was a home. And it even looked like a home. You know, there was nothing disability about it at all. It made a big difference to everybody because I think giving up your child drove a wedge between family, family and the children. She really helped to connect people back with their families because all of a sudden we're asking families for help. We need working bees, so it gave people back their families right, you know, right from the start. It was good because it was a very practical way to reconnect. When we were looking at uh, devolving Rurua into those four regions, uh, we appointed a manager for each of those four regions. We appointed Denise Wardle as the manager, and the manager of the region was Mal Gaskin. Whereas uh, in the other three regions, the services continued to be run by IDSC as a part of an IDSC organisation, Mal thought that there was a, an option uh, in the uh, northern region which would one, deal with the devolution, but two, also provide uh, a foundation for the establishment of new services in the northern region, because this was an area devoid of many services. And so Mal uh, had the idea of establishing a non-government organisation, and he set up a project group, uh, which was Denise Wardle as the manager, uh, Dale Matic, 
and David Felgenhauer, who were project officers who worked on this. And they worked very closely uh, with a number of families. Uh, Lee Keach, uh, Wendy Kogan, Sheila Pinkerton and Marge Kite. They worked slowly towards establishing a new organisation called La Vida Incorporated. And look, it was challenging in the early days. We had a lot of scrutiny, actually. I remember the first time um, when someone passed away. I remember a rural was still near to the end of its life, and some of the staff were actually so I knew this was going to happen, even though there was no, it wasn't a care issue. I guess the biggest change came when Levita took on, I guess, a broader consumer group, and they started to support some people with quite chal what we we was referred to at the time as challenging behaviours. Amanda was in another care home. They were not doing a lot that they should be doing. I was very, very distressed. So I just pulled her out, took her home, and the other parents, they withdrew the kids, but because all of our children were classed as, uh, as they did then, challenging behaviours, not many organisations were doing that. Uh, and certainly La Vida wasn't, which was Lighthouse originally, but they decided that the need was there and they felt they could take up the cause. Raising a child with a disability is a battle. As much as you love your child, it's a battle to raise them uh, for various reasons. It could be their behaviour, it could be lots of issues, trying to get funding, trying to get help, trying to get someone to understand. I loved the fact that it was set up initially by the families which was just amazing, and the fact that they opened their doors to this particular challenge. And it has been a challenge, not just my little girl, <laughs> just caring for these people. So then I guess La Vida had two very distinct consumer groups, people with quite profound severe and multiple disabilities, the original group, and then a group of people who had quite challenging behaviours, who a lot of other providers wouldn't provide a service to. Both groups were quite unique, actually, and both groups came out of family I guess family, family led. But back in those days though, you, you weren't given a choice of where you would go. You are on a list and when your name came up with a vacancy in a house, you were offered that vacancy. We wanted independence for him as much as possible and we wanted to secure his future so that, you know, you know at some stage we weren't going to be able to do it. Um, we weren't going to be around, so we wanted continuity for him. I think as a board that we achieved really well was that we brought in active support. Active support is enabling the client to do as much of what they can for themselves rather than having it done for them. So it's not a hotel model. It makes a person feel valued and it means for Mark, it makes him feel that he belongs and he does things for himself. He makes his own cups of tea. It can be about going out and helping hang the washing on the line. Then they come in and as a group, they fold clothes together. For him, it's about being involved in his own life and it's not just sitting there and having everything done for you. And I think that was a fantastic model when it got brought in. And we were one of the few first organisations to actually do it. It was very highly valued by the department and it's now become a very standard thing across many organisations. The other thing I think that we did very well was we brought in person-centred planning. We got to know a lot better about the clients that we actually have, learn about what they like and making sure that during their weeks they were actually doing what they wanted to do. That's a change in thought processes for staff. The name change came about because there was a lot of confusion between La Vita and La Vida, and so it was about this, making a distinction between the two organisations. House because of the organisation, light um, because it's a beacon, It's interesting now to look back 
1989 and have a look at whether that move away from big institutions um, was successful and whether the Lighthouse has been a successful part of that move. And the answer is emphatically yes. I will be forever grateful that Lighthouse took on the challenge of all of our children the way they did in the manner that they did and the timing that they did when others were just not prepared to. But I wanted to have the best life she can possibly have. Thanks, Mum. I'm just so kind to me. <laughs> Thank you. I want her to be the best person she can be. I wanted her to be healthy. I wanted her to be happy. Nothing out of the ordinary. Oh, that's all I was seeking for her. She always needs that support in every aspect in her life. But, you know, we can all be cared for, but we really need to be supported to do what the everyday person does. I know she's 50, but geez, she's still got a lot of life in her. <laughs>